Years ago on my classroom wall, I displayed a variety of posters from films about Jesus under the banner, Who Do You Say That I Am? The point of the collage was to show the diverse ways filmmakers have interpreted and presented the gospel story to audiences over the recent decades. The one poster that was always a conversation starter was this one here of the 1999 science fiction action film, The Matrix. The question on everyone's mind was, how is that a Jesus film? Today, we'll explore the answer. Released Easter weekend 20 years ago, this film intersects a variety of religious and philosophical belief systems. Christian, Buddhism, Judaism, Zen, Existentialism, Gnosticism, and Platonic, just to name a few. For the sake of simplicity, today I will only discuss the Judeo-Christian theme, as this is my specialty. If you are interested in learning more about how the other belief systems make their way into the film, I recommend the book The Gospel Reloaded by Chris Say and Greg Garrett. As a matter of fact, it's from this source that a lot of today's ideas will be referenced. Additionally, despite launching a trilogy of films as well as an expanded universe, again, for simplicity purposes, we will only examine the first film, even though the religious themes persist throughout the franchise. What is The Matrix? This, of course, is the existential question of the series, even serving as the original website domain. In regards to religious studies, today I have two theories on what The Matrix could symbolize. The first, The Matrix stands for the material things in this world that serve as obstacles to faith. The word itself is Latin for womb, which implies a comfortable and safe existence. Jesus says you can't serve two masters and tells the rich man to go sell all of his possessions before he can be able to follow him effectively. At the Leap of Faith scene, Neo, played by Keanu Reeves, falls to the ground when he doubts his abilities due to what's in front of him. To focus solely on the material world makes it impossible to transcend belief. You think that's air you're breathing now? Christ tells us of a kingdom that we can't see with human minds, offers invisible water that will cure all thirst, and beckons us to participate in the world of the unseen. This requires our willingness to follow the white rabbits of divine moments and risk losing the safety of the familiarity in order to see things more clearly. Once we are willing to give faith our complete attention and be trained in mastering spiritual disciplines, can we then move the mountains that Jesus claims we can do? What are you trying to tell me? that I can dodge bullets. I'm trying to tell you that when you're ready, you won't have to. In this theory, the agents would then be those societal forces that wish to promote their own goods that distract and numb the masses into a sleep of consciousness. Sleep in the Bible is almost always a symbol for a lack of faith or even spiritual death. I know, I once wrote a paper on this. Paul eloquently describes this in Ephesians. Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. You can feel it when you go to church. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. The second theory suggested by Say and Garrett is that the Matrix symbolizes organized religion, a system firmly in place that gives us an acceptable way to deal with reality and a plausible approach to answering the unanswerable questions. Like the Matrix, organized religion keeps people asleep, dreaming, docile, and unable to ask questions or imagine alternatives. The agents, then, would be those people who come down on you every time you try to examine thoughts independent of the religion that has been so firmly implanted. They squelch doubt, not by encouraging you to pursue your own thoughts and arrive at your own conclusions, but instead by sticking a metaphorical gun in your face and threatening you with non-acceptance and the threat that you will go to hell if you don't conform. Morpheus, described by Agent Smith as the most dangerous man alive, teaches throughout the film the importance of seeing things for yourself, that the Matrix can't tell you who you are, and that there's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. As much as my viewers find comfort in the familiarity of religious structure, remember that Christ himself never taught a religion, but a way of life. Moving on, whichever theory holds true, you can't deny that the first film is a retelling of the gospel narrative, with Neo as a Christ figure. Whoa. In fact, all the main characters in this film reflect biblical figures. Neo as Jesus, Morpheus as a God the Father and John the Baptist hybrid, Trinity as the Holy Spirit or a female face of God, and Cypher as a Judas Iscariot Satan hybrid. Let's examine each more closely. In 1999, no one would have imagined casting Keanu Reeves as Jesus Christ. Not quite what you were expecting, right? 
yet the allusions to the name are teased throughout the film. Hallelujah. Jesus. Goddamn. Jesus. You're my savior, man. My own personal Jesus Christ. Like Humble Jesus was from the little backwater town of Nazareth, Keanu Reeves of Bill and Ted's excellent adventure fame, and his Matrix counterpart, Thomas A. Anderson, would have been the least likely type of person expected to step into a messianic role. I'm just another guy. But the name Anderson literally means son of man, with the middle initial A implying that he was one of many potential messianic figures. Historically, before, during, and after the time of Jesus, there were many false messianic movements that typically ended with the execution of its founding member. The question of whether or not Neo is the true messiah is ultimately the main focus of the film's first plot, with each character having their own opinion on the matter. He's the one. The name Thomas calls to mind the apostle from the Gospel of John who doubts without physical proof, or maybe even a reference to the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas. The first person to contact Anderson is Trinity, whose name clearly reflects the theological entity. The Trinity. Her role in the film is similar to that of the Holy Spirit in the Gospel stories. Like when the dove appears and affirms Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, Trinity shows up and does likewise to Neo. The Hebrew word for spirit is the feminine word Ruah, and often has been portrayed as a female entity known as Sophia in the Hebrew scriptures, who states in the book of Proverbs, when you find me, you find life, real life. Trinity fulfills this proverb twice for Neil in the film. At the start, she is the first point of contact in bringing Thomas Anderson out of the matrix. And then again at the end, she's the one who kisses him, bringing Ruah, breath, into Neil's dead being, to resurrect him. Now get up. And when he rises, he becomes more than what he was. But more on that in a second. Morpheus, you're more than a leader to us. You're a father. Morpheus reflects two biblical figures, God the Father and John the Baptist. His name comes from the root word morph, meaning he who forms or molds. Think God molding Adam in Genesis 2. Morpheus calls Neil to fulfill his destiny, but also lets him know that it's his choice to do so. Free will is one of the many ways humans are made in God's image. There are also references to Morpheus being a John the Baptist type figure. Historians have described John as being a true prophet, illuminated, irritable, and passionate, in open rebellion against the Jewish political and religious hierarchies. Leader of a millennialistic sect, John the Baptist announced the imminence of the kingdom, but without claiming the title of its messiah. I still remember sitting in a movie theater 20 years ago thinking the possibility that if Neo wasn't the one, it was definitely Morpheus. But I was wrong. In the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus comes to John for his baptism, Jabab says, I'm the one who should be baptized by you. Morpheus, when greeted by the clearly impressed Neil for the first time, responds with similar awareness. It's an honor to meet you. No, the honor is mine. And note that this exchange takes place during a torrential downpour, a reference to the waters of baptism. The scene ends with Neo taking the red pill that causes him to be born again. Like, literally, there's an umbilical cord there. In the Gospels, Jesus doesn't begin his public ministry until after John the Baptist is arrested by King Herod. Likewise, Neo doesn't step up until Morpheus is similarly taken captive. I believe I can bring him back. John the Baptist, however, was later beheaded, but likely in a concerted effort to include this character in more sequels, Morpheus is not killed in the film. Yet, look at how this camera shot interestingly teases nothing more than his head at the end of this scene. Cypher, of course, is the final lead character, even being displayed alongside the other principals on the theatrical poster. His character is a Judas-Satan hybrid, which, according to the Gospel of Luke, is exactly the reason why Judas betrays Jesus. At the start of the film, we hear two voices. The female is Trinity, the male Cypher. Before there was humanity, some traditions argue that Satan existed alongside the Trinity, once a spirit with a righteous function. This is the arrangement of Cypher on Morpheus's team before challenging his authority. All I do is what he tells me to do. In the Bible, immediately after Jesus gets baptized, he is guided into the desert where he encounters the devil who is there to tempt him. After passing a series of tests to prove whether or not he is the one, Jesus begins his public ministry. So you're here to save the world. What do you say to something like that? Throughout the film, Cypher constantly casts doubts and questions Neo's identity. I mean, how can he be the one 
if he's dead. His betrayal launches the final act of the first film, giving way to Neil's crucifixion and then his resurrection. Note again that it's Trinity's kiss that raises Neil, the breath of God breathing the divine spark back into Christ. And then we get the best resurrection portrayal ever presented in a Hollywood film, yes, even better than those two seconds of a naked calf that Mel Gibson gave us in 2004. Yeah, I still hate that movie. Tradition says that Jesus' post-resurrected body was a glorified one that transcended time and the limitations of natural law. It was a physical body that became something much, much more. It became imperishable and immortal, and I have never seen a Jesus film capture that essence better than what we get here. The Gospel of Luke ends with the ascension of Christ, and so does this film. So what do you need? Besides a miracle. Guns. Lots of guns. Now, before we move on, some skeptics might be quick to point out that Jesus wouldn't have condoned the amount of guns and violence in the film, and so the metaphor isn't spot on. Well, first, remember, this is an action movie that needs to sell tickets and make money so that they can go on and make two lackluster sequels and an expanded universe. So, yeah. And secondly, Jesus said in Matthew 10, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have come not to bring peace, but a sword. Jesus hung out with religious zealots, preached a new kingdom, attracted large crowds who threw him a king's parade, was arrested for overturning the temple, and then was crucified under the charge of a being a political revolutionary. Further, the Greek word for gospel itself has its historical roots in proclaiming victories on the battlefield. Evangelists referred to the person who spread the good news of success during wartime, and the word for the second coming, parousia, refers to the triumphant return of troops coming back from battle. So, yeah, Jesus began a revolution. Jesus and Neo were both born into a conquered world, and as Say and Garrett explain, civil disobedience simply wouldn't work on the machines of the Matrix. The agents would have simply shut you down, and the system would feed you to the next guy. Did you know that the first Matrix was designed to be a perfect human world, where none suffered, where everyone would be happy? It was a disaster. In addition to the gospel imagery, the film forces us to re-examine the truths of the primeval myth stories of Adam and Eve and the Tower of Babel. Say and Garrett explain that mankind longed to be the creator instead of the creation, and so it suffers a betrayal of its own making. The greatest accomplishment of mankind, artificial intelligence, also longs to rule, and so works to overthrow humanity, just as man sought to overthrow God, first in the Garden of Eden, and later through science and reason. According to Genesis, humanity's hubris led to exile and confusion. Where God creates an orderly world, human defection brings it to chaos. This cycle of apostasy persists throughout the entire Bible and continues through today. Before we call it quits, are there any other Judeo-Christian ideas found in this film? This is my ship, the Nebuchadnezzar. Morpheus's ship, the Nebuchadnezzar, refers to the Babylonian king who oppressed the people of Israel, but then after his empire eventually collapsed, and Israel found restoration. This plaque near the ship's nuclear reactor references Mark 3.11, a passage on recognizing the Son of God. Zion. Zion, the last human city, was the name given to Jerusalem and was regarded as a place of holiness, perfection, justice, and hope of God. You're the oracle? Oracle is a literary device in scripture referring to the voice of God. And finally, Morpheus says this quick line that I'm probably reading too much into. The body cannot live without the mind. Um, St. Paul's body of Christ imagery, anyone? Yeah? No? Okay, I think I'm reaching here. Anyways, those are my thoughts, and I certainly enjoyed this opportunity to look back at the theology of a film that came out the exact year 20 years ago when I declared myself a religious studies major in college. So, you might be wondering, was it this film that laid that groundwork for me to become the theology teacher I am today? No, that would have been Jesus Christ Superstar. Superstar.